This is Joe Dancy, uh, Assistant Director with the SMU McGuire Energy Institute in Dallas, Texas. One of our favorite energy experts here at The Crude Life. Not only does he understand energy, but he travels all over the country to conferences. He gets tours. I've never met anybody that knows more about the history and the present of energy than Joe Dancy. So we appreciate him coming on the program today. Fresh back from a tour of the Bakken oil field up in Medora. Of course, you got the VIP treatment from what I understand. That's what a lot of those operators like to do in North Dakota is, is show you the really nice, you know, velvet glove type well sites, which they need to do anyways. But was that the case? Did you get a nice tour up there in the Medora area? Got a fantastic tour. And I'll tell you who I was with, with the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. It's a commission that was established in the 30s to deal with state regulation and federal regulation of oil and gas. And it's composed of uh, regulatory officials from the state and federal level, as well as executives of uh, oil companies, as well as academics. I fit in the academics end of things, uh, along with a few other uh professors that come along with me and we got a, a tremendous tour and of course jason as you know i mean one of the problems and not problems but part of the bakken is up there is in the teddy roosevelt uh, park and of course you if you're operating wells either adjacent or next to a national park you obviously you know i know you're going to be watched very closely and i was very impressed with what we saw the regulators that i was with were very impressed with what we saw um, you know, some of the issues, I mean, I, these are just common issues that elsewhere is obviously, you know, with electric lines, you know, you can't really run an electric line, you know, through the middle of the park. And so quite, quite a few of the sites, everything was self-generated electricity and they were actually what they were doing instead of flaring the natural gas or actually selling the gas, they were using natural gas for electrical generation to power their site. And um, it, it was it was very interesting, and I I didn't know. Here's a couple facts that I was really sort of impressed with. And this is my first time really to the Bakken. To I've been to North Dakota, I just haven't been out to see the wells. And a um, couple number one, the oil is a really light oil, it was 43 API. And actually, if you I sent you the link, I went out in the driveway. I they gave me a bottle of it to take home. As a typical professor, I was asked the president of the company was given a tour and i said Kim, can i take a bottle of that home and he was like well dude because yeah here's a water bottle and he stuck some crude in it and i got it uh, i won't tell you how i got it to dallas but it wasn't on the airplane put it that way um i got it got it to dallas and i took it out in the driveway and you know most crude oil at least in texas is a, a heavier type and it's it'll ignite but it's not very easy to ignite the Balkan stuff it, it was like gasoline it, it went up very quickly and um, illustrates the fact that, you know, when you transport that stuff, it, you need to be concerned. Of course, it had probably some natural gas liquids in it. You have to be concerned about the flammability and, you know, whether you put it in a tank car or whether you put it in a pipeline, um, you have some flammability issues. The other interesting thing is, of course, the water cut up there is above 50 percent, and uh, the water was 280,000 parts per million um salt which means it's 28 percent salt which is it's saturated and it really he goes when it comes up you know as it cools you do have some you know potentially salt issues with things you know salting up and and then you and it's 300 degrees it's 10,000 feet deep was the wells we were at and then the, the laterals were 10,000 feet long so you have two miles down two miles across roughly and um and it's 300 degrees fahrenheit so everything not only is it salty, it's really hot. And then he told me, and of course, thank God I was up there, you know, this time of year. He goes, you know, in January, it could be 30 below and you'd have a blizzard out here. And we inject right on the well site. We inject the salt water because we don't want it because we don't want to truck salt water off the site because of potential, you know, when it's a blizzard and it's 20 below, you don't want a truck full of salt water going down a small gravel windy road. And so, uh, but he said, actually, it gets so cold that the salt water will actually freeze up between the storage tank and the salt, salt and everything else. Like actually, they built it looks like a little garage that has the injection, the injection uh, wellhead. And they said the only reason they stick that up out there is because you know they don't want the injection well freezing up. So I was very impressed though. They did a great job, and uh, the regulators were impressed. There were a lot of good questions. 
Um, and it's a, you know, they did say <laughs> when you have construction activity in the middle of winter, the ability to keep construction workers when, you know, the average temperature is seven below in January or whatever it is up there. Um, they said it's difficult, even if you pay them really well, you know, the, you have a big turnover, but, uh, but such is life. That's, uh, you know, if you want to work, you can make good money. That was the number one concern during the downturn was retaining workers and keeping rig counts because one of the issues North Dakota has is once, once a, a family leaves, a lot of times, they go start a new job, maybe catch on with Walmart or you know some other distribution logistics company or something along those lines. They don't come back. It's you know it's it, it, they got hard winters and uh, we're aware of that. And so retaining workers is one of the difficult challenges. The other challenge that North Dakota has, which I believe it's a challenge. Um, I haven't had any government officials or uh, regulatory officials agree with me, but I think it's a challenge when over 50% of your budget is reliant on one industry. The North Dakota state government uh, has 50% of their general budget tied to the extraction and production tax. Think about that for a second. 50% of your state budget is tied to one industry. I think that's problematic, but you know that's, that's for them to decide and me to comment on, I guess. Especially when you consider the amount of DNR licenses, license plate fees, that sort of thing that's not counted in the study that was done to attach the, the general budget, et cetera. You know, there's, there's been some whiffs of downturn, and North Dakota's been talking about 30,000 jobs hiring for a long time. Any uh, conversations happening at that conference about the, you know, just the oil industry's ties to North Dakota as far as the, the amount of dollars and just the the sheer i'll be honest the sheer reliance the state has on the oil and gas industry itself i mean there's even some turnovers when you're talking about drilling permits joe yeah actually you make some really good points the uh the governor of north dakota actually talked to us for an hour he is an awesome speaker he was and one of the things he brought up was just what you noted is the reliance of the state government on oil and gas revenues He's a, you know, was a, I can't remember his, his entire story, but it's a very, he's a businessman type. Uh, and one of the problems, or not one of the problems, one of the things he was proud about, and I don't know whether this is a, and I don't know if it was a party issue or whatever, but they actually have some new legislation, and you're probably aware of it, where they're increasing the split of oil royalties with the Native American tribes, so the Native Americans can actually develop on their lands more of the oil and gas resource and so when i don't know the numbers involved he talked about it i sort of it went you know in one of my ears and not the other i didn't take any notes because obviously it's north dakota specific and i'm down here in texas and in oklahoma uh and i really you know the, the revenue structure up in north dakota is sort of interesting but it is but you know you talk about a god-awful beautiful place Medora was beautiful we stayed in bismarck for a day when we went up there of course, getting up there is is a somewhat of a challenge. Some of the people from California were complaining about, you know, the number of planes they had to use to get to, I guess, Dickinson or Bismarck. But, but Lord knows. I mean, when, you know, for six months of the year, um, and I love winter, so it's one of those deals. If, uh, but I, it, And as you know, if you're in the oil business, there's probably no better place to really jump in. And obviously, and I, of course, working in having spent the last two years, I'm in Dallas now with SMU, but... Having spent the last two years in uh, in Oklahoma, of course you have Continental Resources and Harold Ham right there in Oklahoma City, and they're uh, he's a legend. It's a great company, and they're up there drilling up the drilling up the uh, drilling up the farm, so to speak. And and then we got a, we also got a tour of um, the Freiburg oil and gas uh, rail facility, and they're shipping out you know every day sixty five thousand barrels of oil. Every um, every tank car I think is 650 barrels, and they have 100, 103 cars per. And you, Jason, and they would let, let us take pictures because a, a potential you know the, the cameras have to be uh, spark proof so there's no explosions. But the I can tell you they've been in operation now for five or six years, and they've loaded crude oil for five or six years. The the cement. The everything, the buildings, they look like you could eat off the floor. I mean, it was just incredibly, and I think they're operated now by, I think, Marathon, but 
I forget exactly who's who's involved up there. But uh, the Freiburg Terminal, and I don't know if they give tours to everybody, but it was very impressive, not only the physical terminal, not only the rail cars, but inside, you know, they had a super, it was like a NASA um, control room with, you know, all sorts of indications of, you know, crude oil temperatures, crude oil pressures. It took them, it took them, God, I think about 40 minutes uh, to load every 600 and 650 barrel car and um they had they, they load 18 cars at a time and they um it's very it's very it's a very interesting operation and of course you compare that to pipelines um it's a it's a very different operation and i um on one hand I, you know probably statistically rail transport is more dangerous on the other hand they're hiring you know they're i can't remember how many people they have employed there but just to fill the train they have you know, three people on the cars all the time. And then they were shipping out liquefied natural gas also, or liquefied um, petroleum gas and, and uh, propane, et cetera, from another, from the same terminal at a different loading station. So you, you have, you know, good employment up there and, and uh, for the rail cars versus a, versus a pipeline where you probably don't have as many people involved, but it, it may be statistically a bit safer. Although you can argue, I mean, you guys had that big spill here a few years ago where it leaked for several months and they're still cleaning the, the thing up. So uh, anyway, that's my impression of, uh, and the regulators did have some concerns about, you know, uh, both North Dakota, actually um, the whole industry in general. And we can talk about that if you want to go there. Yeah, I wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit for a couple reasons. One is what I mentioned earlier about, you know, we've got some bigger companies making some changes. You know, we don't need to, Cite whiting every time as the prime example, but in the Bakken, it's certainly applicable because whiting is the largest mineral rights holder in the Bakken. So they've they've went through some changes. Other companies have gone through changes, especially down in Texas. So you've got you know you've got leases that are transferring in some cases to very unexperienced companies, especially in North Dakota, getting ready to drill in sub-zero temperatures for the first time. So to me, that's a concern. Number two, much like the last downturn, we saw people having to sharpen their pens and their pencils, especially on frac sand. I mean, frac sand, I think they had to figure out a way to make their product half as cheap and quite twice as fast and twice as quick, you know, the last downturn. And they did. Good for them. That seems like it's going on right now with innovation. The shelf life of innovation is like a year long, two years long. And then if the companies don't innovate, they get dropped for a new, shinier, better company. Do you, do you understand what I mean by this, Joe? Yeah, exactly. Actually, there's, that's, those are some really good points. I, one of the concerns about the regulators, and because these are state and federal regulators, um, they bring up, you know, the, we're in a very volatile industry and things are starting to slow down a little bit. And what the regulators are real concerned about is some of the properties being forcefully sold. Either, you know, the bankers say, hey, you need to sell properties to improve your balance sheet or, you know, you may be going out of business. So you need to forcefully, you know, have the property transfers from, say, a larger company to a smaller company or actually a smaller company to a smaller company. It really doesn't matter. But what the regulators are concerned about, Jason, is the fact that, if you are acquiring properties, um, the financial responsibility for plugging or for an environmental problem, you know, if you have a, if you have uh, um, frac fluid come to the surface and you have to clean it up, you need to have the financial resources. And under the bonding um, surety type of situation they have now, you know, you may have you know one plugging bond for fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, and have you know ten thousand wells and Obviously, if you go bankrupt or have some really, you know, credit issues, um, and you have environmental problems, uh, the state doesn't want to. The state doesn't want the public to get stuck with, and it, with with wells that ha are not plugged or not being operated. And this has happened in Pennsylvania in the last four or five years. There's an operator that went bankrupt there, and he left, or they left uh, hundreds of wells that were unplugged. Actually, it happened, I think, in Wyoming also with the. Uh, coal bed methane wells where where a small operator got a hold of you know thousands of these wells and ends up in the state of wyoming as i understand you know got stuck with 20 million dollars with a plugging liability um so 
on the other hand, the regulators understand the business, and they said, you know, we don't want to jump in, Joe, and tell people, you know, you can't sell properties and you can't buy property because that's part of the business. I mean, you, you and I, if we both were operating up in North Dakota and, you know, depending on where our acreage is at, you and I would be probably swapping acreage or swapping wells because, you know, you know you have five well sites and you could, if I send you my 10 well sites and then you have an acreage where I'm operating, I'll buy five of your well sites and we'll just swap the acreage. You know, those type of deals, they happen all the time. And that's why, you know, you get landman, you get right-of-way agents, you get companies, the finance people, all the lawyers, you get, the, get them involved in all these transactions. And uh, you know, the, the regulators don't want to stop in. They don't want to stop that because they realize how dynamic it is. On the other hand, you know, if you are if you are unloading some, you know, marginal properties on someone who really is irresponsible or can't, I won't say irresponsible, but they can't be responsible because they don't have the capital structure to operate correctly, you know, that creates some real issues for them. And so they're all scratching their heads as to what the heck to do. And they, this has been an issue the last two or three years, but it's becoming, the voices are getting a little louder because rightfully or not, they are looking down the road and saying, gee, things seem to be slowing down a bit. And of course, you look at the drill, the rig count nationwide is down like 12%, which things are slowing down a little bit. Um, and I don't know where things are going. Of course, natural gas prices too are really, really low. And that's an entire other issue with regard to flaring up there and how well industry has responded. But uh, so that was some of the some of the concern. And, and even your talk about the, your mention about the technology, you know, the, we got a tour of the Torex uh, um, drill bit company in Norman, Oklahoma. They sell drill bits nationwide. I actually taught a course uh, up at Oklahoma City University College of Law for a week-long course, and I took them down to this Torex plant. And each bit on a lot of these unconventional plays is custom designed, and they said essentially the technology lasts – it's like a race car. It's like it lasts six months to a year, and then it's like, you know, you – you're like putting on fins and, and, and spoilers and everything else. And then competition, you know, figures things out and makes their d- drill bit a little bit better. And then you got to go back and, but it is, it's very interesting to see how each one of those little, those little teeth and, and everything is custom designed using, you know, a three dimensional model and in, in all the, you know, the stress on each bit or each, and it depends on the formation of, you know, the Bakken, will have a much different bit than, say, the Barnett or the Permian. And they're all custom designed. The joke was, they told me, I, they're worth each little each little uh, disc in there, the diamond cutters, like $250. And there was like dozens of them. And so they were, they the bits, I don't, they didn't tell me what they charged for them, but it's expensive. So they told me I could take one home if I could lift it in my trunk. And obviously that was the joke because there's no way in hell you can lift, you can lift a, a drill bit into the trunk of the car by yourself. So anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating industry. So that was their, that was some of their main concerns. So let, let me just ask you point blank then without speculating, cause that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, I have seen some similar signs to a downturn than from where we had the last time, but it certainly seems to me like people are more prepared and are, accepting the signs much more than last time. And I'll pre-qualify that a bit bit further by saying the last time the downturn came, there was about a year where people spent just being positive. I, I call it gaslighting themselves where they were just saying, oh yeah, we're remaining positive. And I'm thinking we got $30 oil for like six, eight months straight here. This, we, it's, it's, it's time to say it's a downturn or it's, it's here, you know, low, low prices. Are you seeing any of those signs? Like I mentioned, you know, the, um, the shelf life of the innovation, there's that. Um, I, I'm noticing, you know, like I mentioned the frac sand before. This time I'm seeing some other industries, mostly the technology ones, becoming the early signs or the early chicken littles, if you will, the canary in the coal mine or whatever the heck phrase you want to say. Are you ex- seeing or uh, any other signs besides that drill bit one you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah, actually, the um, a couple of them are the the drill. The uh, rig count is down like twelve percent from a year ago. The Torex bit plant. They told me they said essentially it, it sort of the drill bit market follows the 
drill rig market, which makes sense. And they said things, orders have slowed down for them. And they said, actually, they said they haven't had any layoffs, but when people leave, they're not replacing them at this point just because they, you know, they've been through, a, it's, they've been making these bits now for at least 25 years. So they sort of see the, uh, see the industry. And of course, as you know, I mean, you just mentioned oil prices, but natural gas prices. I mean, you talk about brutal. I mean, gee, it is, it is, it's tough to make if you're drilling for natural gas, boy, Lord help you, because it's tough to sell that stuff and make any money, even when you're really efficient. Um, but going forward, as you know, I mean, the, the time to buy is when things are depressed. And there is nothing, Jason, right now, talking to the people I've dealt with for the last 20 or 30 years on oil and gas equities, they tell me things they have never seen ever in their professional careers. And these people are extremely successful They've never seen equities so depressed um, based on cash flow models. This is just not guessing. This is, this is, you know, when you take a, whether you have an apartment complex, whether you have a food store, whether you have an oil company, if you take the cash flow, you generally all, if you have the identical cash flow and identical timing, the valuation of all three of those entities should be identical. And they said, you know, the oil company will sell, you know, at less than half or maybe a third of what it should sell for a on a cash flow model, which telling is telling them, you know, number one, the people in the finance business in New York or wherever they're from, um, number one, are heavily discounting the oil and gas business. And they think that all you have to do is go up to North Dakota, put a well in and you get a to 2000 barrel a day well and we can maintain the oil and gas production going forward um, for as far as you can see, which which is this is the explanation I'm hearing anyway from people. And um, or the other uh, other explanation is we're going to get in a big tr- trade war with China and the economy is going to go backwards and no one there's going to be no demand. But the issues are, you know, you look one of the stunning things that the finance industry doesn't realize right now is that production from unconventional wells has actually the productivity of the wells has flattened and the actually the growth in production has slowed way way down it surprises a lot of people and actually raymond james just put out a report as well as the energy prospectus group out of houston just put out you know reports that you know essentially what they're looking at the data and they're saying oh my god you know we were you know last year we had and i forget what the increase is you know 1.7 million barrels per day or whatever increase in production and they say this year it's going to be a fraction of that because the the well productivity has declined and one of the reasons is at least this is a speculation i'm i, I tell my students I'm, I'm sort of like a parrot i listen to all these experts that come into my class or elsewhere and then i parrot you know whatever they say if it if it sounds reasonable what the experts are telling me, and these are engineering guys that have been around for a while, is that when you drill a parent well, it's a parent-child issue where the fracking is getting so good with stuff like the sand that you're mentioning. The sand, the water, the frac fluids, they're just, the first well is just breaking up the formation so well underground that and when you produce it for a while, you're sucking all the pressures out. So when you drill the child well, the child wells are coming in very, very disappointingly, and I've I've seen this, you know, not only from the experts I see, but at the Society of Petroleum Engineers student chapter up in Norman, uh, we had some speakers come in from um, from one of the local uh, SPE uh, chapters and actually presented their professional papers on the parent-child well. It actually got in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, which is interesting because they actually picked up the concept from some of my LinkedIn posts and called me and talked about it. And then, of course, they write a huge article and. You know, they didn't mention you didn't mention our student, you know, presentation or myself and it uh, or the other people that I refer to. But they but they did point out the problem. They did a great a great job of it. Uh, you know, the wells are starting to disappoint. And if when you know you look a year from now, if production is substantially like, you know, 75 percent below the growth is 75 percent below where they thought it would be. I mean, people may start paying attention and say, gee. We're using a million to two million more barrels per year of oil globally. We thought we we're going to get a million to two million barrels more from North America unconventional. We only got three hundred thousand. Is that a problem? Well, it's a problem, but if it, it it can fix itself with the economics. And so, I agree with you that things are slowing down right now. But I and it's going to 
it may take a year for people to realize this, but at some point, the cyclicality will go, you know, we'll see the correct price for oil, I think, to maintain production is somewhere between you know, 55 and $75 a barrel. And just by the way, the Raymond James report predicts that we will see $75 a barrel oil in the fourth quarter and also going into the next year. They're, they're, they actually project the first and second quarter that oil prices will go up into the you know $90 or so for a, for a period of time Why why the industry catches up. And as you've noted, one of the problems with the cyclicality is you know, to get the skilled people up up in North Dakota or anywhere, you know, you you don't hire them because you know, we have our drill counts are down. Then all of a sudden, you know, you want to add two more rigs and a bunch of completion um, crews, and you, there is, the people aren't out there. And so, uh, anyway, it's a major issue. Well, this is where the crude life, you know, brings in the big bucks because we like to bring in experts like yourself and other people to remind everybody that these interviews can actually be useful in your day-to-day life. So we're going to take a step back here. And what you mentioned earlier is right. The rig count is down, so of course the drill bits are going to be down. So if we take that and flesh it out through the entire supply chain, you're looking at safety instructors, you're looking at engineers, you're looking at all, I mean, go through it. If you're involved in the oil and gas industry, and the rig count is down, that is eventually going to impact you. So it's it, it's important to take a step back every now and then and say, oil and gas is one of the kings of the economy. Oil and gas is one of the things that does make the economy go. In fact, over the last 10 years, the oil and gas industry, actually it's 13 now, the oil and gas industry, the mining industry is the only industry that's added jobs. So it's the only reliable one. Yet, when you've got a down spike in rig count, eventually that's going to work its way down to the, like I said, the safety instructors, the engineers, the cafe owners, the truckers. It might take six months. It might take four months. It might take eight months. But what, what, just your comment on that, you know, the, the ripple effect through the supply chain. Yeah, exactly. And I will say something, though. It is interesting. I've been out to Midland. Of course, I've been driving around Oklahoma to the uh, the truck traffic from the oil field at least in the you know where I was over by Medora did not they, you could see the trucks but they were nowhere near the frequency and the levels that you see here in parts of Texas and parts of Oklahoma and and certainly in Midland in Midland everybody's driving a truck and it's or a white pickup truck and you know I, I, I have gone out there and you know, Lord knows, and they're not small trucks, all these, you know, they're hauling the equipment around or the crude or the, and it's uh, quite intimidating, but it was, I felt very comfortable. Um, of course, I wasn't driving either. We were all on, they bust us all around all these places. And, um, but this, yeah, I felt very comfortable, you know, on the roads up there that, uh, but actually I did drive up there. I drove, I drove from Bismarck, which is a beautiful city, by the way, uh, uh, over to, and actually stopped in Mandan, which is interesting. they they, by the railroad, uh, they had some environmental issues years and years ago, and it's part. It's in my textbook, and so I had to stop and take pictures of the Mandan Rail Terminal, and they actually had some leaks underneath the city there, and they actually fixed them very uh, efficiently by drilling some water wells and actually pulling the the product out and separating it and reinjecting the water. It's a it's a great environmental story as to you know, finding a problem and then fixing it. And it's, like I say, it's been in my textbook and now I finally got to visit the, I got to visit the site of the, the site of the um, remediation, which was pretty cool. But uh, in any event, just uh, going back to the trucks and everything else, it is, it is, there is a, it's sort of like a traffic jam where, the, you know, you things slow down and hell, everything slows down and it creates, the problem is again, when you speed up, it's difficult to get good people that are experienced that'll stick around once once you need them and uh yeah lord knows i think we will need them you know probably in the next couple of years because if raymond james is correct and the energy prospectus group is correct and a few other people i follow are correct you know the, the prices may weaken as you know just for a number of reasons over the next six months to the year but then they'll turn around and, and if you look at the volatility of oil prices and gas prices um yeah, you know, both of them. Oh boy, it's it's hard to make decisions in this business, Jason, because you're you're spending five million dollars to drill a well or ten million dollars to drill a well, and you don't know whether the price of oil is going to be thirty dollars or a hundred dollars. And you got 
all sorts of smart people telling you both. <laughs> well, you got you, <laughs> you know guys the, like you and I talking. It's pretty exciting. To, I mean, as a as a someone looks from the sideline, it's pretty darn exciting. I have Dr. Lawrence Scott on our program six times a year, and he mentions every single time. And by the way, he helps some of the top countries and and companies in the world with oil and gas and economics. He's a Professor Irmata, uh, how do you pronounce that? Irmata, Irmata, uh, E-M-I-T-E-R-U-S. Anyway. Uh, emeritus, emeritus, yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. He's a, he, that, means he, that means you're like a super expert. Yes, <laughs> yes, and that's why I didn't want to mispronounce it because, you know, by the way, folks, it's like 6 a.m. here where Joe, Mr. Joe Dancy and I are doing the interview, so we're, we're both having our morning coffee. But uh, he's Professor of Economics at Louisiana State University. In fact, he helps write Louisiana's budget um, for the, the, you know, for the, for the state, he says all the time, the oil and gas industry projecting oil prices in the economy is the hardest thing on the planet, uh, behind predicting the climate. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> so he, he says, you know, that's two of the hardest things on the planet here. Everybody thinks they've got it figured out. Well, there ain't any way to figure out either one of them. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's no model that you've been able to even be correct for five years. On either right. one of them. So, anyway, uh, I did want to mention something, though. Uh, we, we, we talked a little bit. Or you mentioned um, that Raymond James is projecting the possibility of, you know, $75 oil. We'll just say that. I, I, I'll i tell you what. I'll put my conspiracy hat on and my coincidence hat. I love a good conspiracy, and I love a good coincidence. Um, that, that timing would actually seem about right for when the industry flat out came, or came out and said, listen, guys, we got 30,000 jobs available in North Dakota alone. We got 50,000 jobs down in the Permian just waiting for anyone that wants to go back to school. But they didn't say this. You got to go back to school for one to two years to get certified under this new technology, this new regulation, this new innovation. And guess what? A lot of people from other countries and from other economic statuses went to school, and got those degrees. So I think you're going to see a new influx of a melting pot come into the oil and gas industry if your prediction is right of $75 oil because there are people getting certified and the traditional workers are kind of not. Did you know what I mean by that? Yeah, actually, it's funny you say that. I mean, one of the things that we flew in the Bismarck, beautiful airport, beautiful, it was it was. A great experience. On the way to Medora, we drove through Bismarck and actually through Mandan. There were a number of billboards that were like, get trained for the oil business. And it's like with with a college or a community college or a training school. And I thought that was pretty cool. I said, God, look at this. You know, you get off the airplane and they got billboards looking for people to go to work. And, you know, and of course, they, it's a, the educational institutions are I assume are probably, you know, obviously trying to recruit people, but also that I'm sure the industry is, is working hand in hand. Cause you don't, you don't put out work. You don't train people for a year or two at whatever school you're at. And if they can't find jobs, your, your, your program doesn't last too long, but just talking to the companies, et cetera. And just as we've talked, you know, that get skilled people, you know, if you have a training facility or a training college there, um, and it looks like North Dakota does an excellent job on higher education with regard to, you know, whether it's whether it's colleges or whether it's just uh, uh, trade schools. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. And it just tell, told me you just don't even in Midland, you don't Midland, Texas, you don't see, you know, billboards, you know, go to school and, you know, get a job. And it's like it's pretty much I should have taken a picture that I sort of. You know, I sort of pinched myself. I was like, God, I should have pulled out my phone and took a picture. It's like, God, you guys aren't going to believe this. You know, my students here in, in Dallas, it's like, you know, if you really want a, you know, a job, you, you can go up. And, of course, I wouldn't show this to my students at SMU. They all may, you know, move up to Bismarck and learn how to be a, you know, a, a field welder or something <laughs> and make twice as much as they would from uh, – yeah, working here in, in Texas. So that, that's nah, that's, that's, that's a joke. Um, in any event, it's, it, it was very, I, I felt very good about it. I mean, that just goes to show you the energy business is good. I mean, it is adding value. It's adding worth to the state. It's adding worth to families who can afford a house and a career, um, although it's a cyclical career. I mean, and that's the, one of the problems with our industry is, boy, if you're young, you just kind of realize 
you know, you're going to be laid off several times in the, in the sick locality, but you just have to develop, continue to develop your skill set. And if you have a decent skill set, you can, like anything else, you know, if you go work for Ford or General Motors, you're not going to work for them your entire life either. It's, it's so cyclical. Every business is. So anyway. Getting the natural gas, you mentioned that earlier. You got to see firsthand some on-site natural gas generation. Of course, you know, North Dakota has not hit its flaring numbers in, in, in a while. In the Permian, they're, you know, I think they're giving it away or paying people actually to come and take it. So natural gas is an issue, but there are solutions out there. Uh, we're, yeah. We're, yeah, just give me an update where, where your observations, where your thoughts and updates are when it comes to natural gas and integrating these innovations, these science projects uh, into the field. Well, let me, let me tell you some of the regulators. I sort of, you know, you sit there and, you know, we had the governor of North Dakota. We had all the high-level regulators from North Dakota there. We had the railroad commissioner from Texas, the Oklahoma high-level regulators. And they say, you know, the flaring has decreased substantially in most areas. And even though you're flaring, you know, less than 5% of the gas, it is so visible. They said, you know, Joe, for an industry standpoint, even though the economics may really hurt you, it may be better for these companies to shut the wells in versus flaring because the public goes nuts. And they should because they go by on their highway and it looks like, you know, it looks like the, well, the, the Balkan is nowhere near as bad as the Permian Basin. I have a good, good professor friend at SMU. He flew from phoenix to dallas at night and he said he looked out as they flew over the permian it looked like the whole permian basin was on fire and this is like six months ago um and you know the and the, i could tell you for a fact the railroad commission in texas is extremely concerned about flaring and we're they are building in both north dakota and elsewhere you know the pipeline system out although as you know it's really expensive to build pipelines one of the impressive things that i saw for the first time i've never been to an oil loading facility but the freiburg oil loading facility and only loads oil but they also load um propane butane i think i call it y factor and um and other um liquefied natural gas uh type uh proponents and essentially they were sending i think 14 uh rail cars 650 barrels per car um they were they were liquefying and shipping that out as product. And it's interesting, Jason, you wouldn't believe where the North Dakota natural gas, a lot of it is going in, in the tank cars, the liquefied propane, et cetera. And I was like pretty shocked myself. They said, Joe, there's a huge market in Mexico. We're sending all these tank cars down to Mexico. And it's interesting because they said, you know, it's 70 degrees up there when I, you know, at, at, well, I was actually 80 or so, but you fill a car up with, with liquefied, um, natural gas liquids and you ship it to mexico where it's 105 um they they actually underfill the cars to a certain extent to take in account the different pressures because they said obviously we don't want to fill it totally full and then it gets to mexico and gets overheated and you have you know you have the pop-off valve come off and you're you're shooting you're losing product as well as you're polluting the environment but they said there's a a large and growing so they're shipping from you could hop on that rail car in theory, you know, and be a be a hobo or whatever, and actually ride. They go actually the the the, the market demand in Mexico for natural gas in these tank cars, the natural gas liquids, the propanes, the ethylenes, or whatever. The and I'm not a chemist, and I I didn't write all this stuff down, and I should have when the guy was talking. But uh, and they said, and they also said they said you know some areas there are some people in the United States that use the. And they said we can. We can odorize the natural gas liquids that are, are used if it needs to be odorized right there at the site in Freiburg, um, North Dakota. Or, you know, most of the most of the people odorize it themselves. So they you ship the propane down to Mexico and then they take it off the car and they odorize it right there, which I thought was real interesting. And they said we can they can actually you specify, you know, we want you to put in, you know, so much odorant per I don't know how they measure odorant, but apparently there's different levels. And I thought that was all pretty fascinating. And, of course, it's all safety controlled, and they have operators up there, and they have all sorts of um, – again, and it's way out – you know, they have, like – it's way out in the country. So if there's any explosions, there's any fires, there's any lightning strikes, um, they told me, like I say, you know, anybody pulls out their camera, you know, they'll break your arm because your camera is not – 
not uh, explosive proof. And so what they did for me, because I said, look, I'm a professor. I'd like to show my students this. They said, hey, you know, we've taken some pictures for some of our internal and they shipped me some pictures. And you'll, you'll get a kick out of this, Jason. I was going to show my I'm talking to show my students this, these pictures this month. But they showed the pictures they took and they sent me as, as what stuff we look at is like there's like a foot of snow on everything. And I, I'm sure when I pull it out, tell them, yeah, I was up there two months ago, and here's the Freiburg rail terminal, and it looks like it's you know snowing in in August. Uh, they'll get a kick out of that. But uh, anyway, it was very it, it was it was very interesting. You know, the uh, crude life, we've been talking about that uh, natural gas market down in Mexico for three, four, five years. I remember Lee Tillman talking about that, uh, shipping them those molecules down even to South America, that south of the uh, U.S. border is just salivating for our natural gas. That's one of the reasons why a year ago we just started pontificating you know, what would a world look like if we said, let's let's take some of those solar and wind subsidies that we've been giving that industry for 40 years, and they've been missing their own benchmarks, their own milestones. So this is not a political thing. This is that they've gotten 40 years of subsidies. They have not made either one affordable for the average consumer yet. So what would happen if we shifted some of those uh, those solar and wind subsidies to natural gas, which is a clean energy as well. And there's an abundance of it. And maybe some of these, you know, crazy guys that are living at well sites making energy on site while their families, you know, sacrifice and that sort of thing. What have, have you ever thought about that? You know, what would, and this is not a political discussion against solar and wind. What I'm saying is that there are subsidies going towards energy. If we shifted some of those subsidies to give or open up new subsidies, whatever. The only reason I say subsidies is because the oil and gas companies are taxed more than anybody. And they don't really get a lot of uh, re- regulatory breaks and a number of different things. So they're, you know, And they also make sure that the churches have bake sales and the Little League baseball teams have uniforms. So they do their fair share and beyond is what I'm getting at that. Sometimes they just don't have enough money left over for science projects and research and development. So as an educator, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? You know, especially what would a world look like if we had some influx of cash for natural gas? Because the buyers are there. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, the, um, the demand in Mexico is really robust. And I, actually, this is, a, this is a perfect lead in. The, when I talk, I'm trying to talk to my students today about ownership theory in the United States, mineral ownership. In Mexico, the government owns the minerals. And so one of the problems you have is the government, is obviously, their, their analysis of risk and reward and drilling and where they drill is much different than the United States where you have private mineral owners who can actually you know they have to take the risk they can go bankrupt or they can become rich um or and they can use we have the deep financial markets with new york providing all sorts of you know venture capital etc actually even look at the eagleford formation you know i tell the the smile of the eagleford it's on stuck on the face of of this is the field the shape of it the the half smile stops at the mexico border and four or five years ago one of my students raised his hand and said you know, professor, does the eagle fern stop at the Mexican border? It's like, well, no. You know, the geologists tell me it keeps going, but in Mexico, you know, number one, it's extremely dangerous to, to drill down in that part of the country. But also, the government owns the, and so you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the incentive to drill, and so, and for us, the United States, it's an incredibly great opportunity for us to take a product. Like I say, the Freiburg Terminal, and actually I visited, and I don't have it in front of me. They they have a brand new natural gas processing facility up there in the, and it's within 10 minutes of the Freiburg facility. And it's been built within the last five years. And actually they take the natural gas and they are actually stripping out the liquids and cleaning it up and, and making it pipeline quality. But all that stuff historically has been flared in North Dakota and elsewhere. And now that you, and the, the plant was, I mean, it's been built, and it was. It's. I don't know how many millions they spent on it, but it was. It was beautiful, also, and that's also at the plant. They were telling me, yeah, when they constructed the latest facility, it was this winter. They said, you know, when it's thirty below, because you you can pay construction workers whatever you want, but they work for about a week, and most, you know, quite a few of them decide, hey, 
you know, I'm not going to be, a, <laughs> this is, this is great work, but it isn't for me. And, uh, and anyway, it was, it was a beautiful facility, but the fact that we have this advantage, we have the private mineral ownership and we have the ability and right now, you don't even need to put a pipeline in with these liquids. And I hadn't thought about this, you know, you stick them in a rail car and you could take that darn rail car. And actually, I don't even know if you, I'm, I know some areas they used to be able to take rail cars and you put them on a barge and you could actually, you know, barge it, you know, across the ocean. Of course, Mexico were connected, but I mean, if you if you took those liquids, uh, I guess you could unload them into a into a ship and and ship them from Houston or wherever, uh, uh, California, elsewhere. But uh, but mainly, I mean, Mexico has is such a robust market from what I understand, and it's growing, and the demand for energy is growing. You know, the fact you can put in, you know, a, a 650 barrels of propane, ship it from Medora, North Dakota, to wherever in Mexico, and make money. I mean, you talk about a business, boy, that's a, that's a, and the other thing is, I've had some experts in talk about natural gas liquids. They say historically, you either go for oil when you drill, or you go for gas. Natural gas liquids were sort of like your ugly sister that you didn't want anything to do with. <laughs> and they said, right now, that creates some real opportunities the last four or five years because, you know, the regulators are saying you can't flare it. There's a market for it. You can sell it. You Historically, the, the prices are have weakened for liquids from what I've been told, I, and I don't follow them that closely either, um, and I really should, um, but – they, the, the people in the business tell me whether you ship natural gas liquids or whether uh, or whether you um, sell them or produce them, there is a niche and it's very the return on investment is very, very profitable. And there's only four or five companies that really specialize in that type of business. And they gave me the names. And I told some of my students after they heard this presentation, you know, if you want to go work for a niche company that's making money, it's growing. Boy, this is an area and there's not. You know, unlike the oldsters like me, you know, like he mentioned, nobody, the experts in the liquids area are not as prevalent as in the oil business or in the gas, natural gas business. So anyway, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting stuff. See, where my mind is, is I'm thinking, okay, we live in such a world where something like this could happen, where we have 3D printers. We actually have, we, we actually have companies right now that are printing homes they are 3d printing homes with concrete okay so that that that's a real thing that's happening in today's world i mean just think about you know some super plastic that you can make on the well site you know for, for one you can generate power so you can pump it right into the grid or you can use it right on your well site number two you can make some super plastic who knows right on site with a 3d printer you could be printing out like 500 dollars super pools that you can put in your backyard with some, you know, that goes away. You got to remember, concrete is one of the least green things on the planet. In fact, if you look at the number one polluter in the planet, it's an argument between cell phones and concrete. So plastic replacing concrete in some areas is not a bad thing. In fact, in some communities right now, they're using plastic for roads. So imagine if you're, you know, on, on a well site, you're taking that flared gas and you're printing out sections of road right on site that the DOT is coming in and using on some of these, you know, may, may, maybe some low roads less traveled type of a thing, you know, that right now they just got these muck roads there that during a rainstorm, they can fly off at any given time. So I, that's where my mind is, is that I see the integration of different technologies right there on the well site i mean you've like i said you got some crazy guy up in canada mining bitcoins on natural huh. gas i mean it, it, so if if there was some ability for people to think as opposed to reacting to how am i going to pay my mortgage next next month because i've lived at this well site for two years and if i go home my wife's going to kill me <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the reality out there. And, and I, I, I look at those guys and I don't know, Joe, I, I look at the world and I guess I from time to time, it'd be nice to see somebody with some passion get their day in the sun. And right now, right. the energy industry right now is filled with a bunch of clever capitalists filled with passion and they're running out of resources. Right. And I tell you, let me, and I'm just, I'll just mention this, the, uh, one of the things I've taught now for 39 years, which is sort of incredible, the, 
Um, I go back and I mean, it's sort of like you're, you're on, you know, you're driving down the road in a pickup truck and you pull up and you're at the train station and the train's ready to go. But the, uh, the interesting thing with regard to the energy sector, looking back is currently, and you've helped a lot on this with regard to perceptions, a lot of people that are very, very smart people have a very poor impression of the energy sector and this includes i might mention it might it includes also solar and wind you have people and you know coal obviously and oil and gas and they you know it's sort of like dudes you know everybody's going to drive a tesla and they don't really think that you know if you have a tesla you need to mine the lithium you need to provide the electricity from somewhere you just don't you know your car isn't really environmentally neutral i mean actually it's much worse than a gasoline car according to some people but the, the, the impression of the energy sector is so negative that it's really disheartening for me, having done so well in the industry, have taught for years, have a number of students who have done incredibly well working as executives or attorneys for different companies or for themselves or with firms, to see the negative publicity from, you know, and a lot of these are from people in positions of political power, but let me just be real, you know, straight and or economic power, too. And uh, it is it, it's unfortunate because energy provides a longer health. It provides better food, a better diet, you know, opportunities. And and it's just incredibly disappointing to me as a citizen of the United States. that has one of the only countries where we can privately own minerals to have such a negative perception of the industry from our leaders. And I, I just, you know, going forward, Jason, I mean, guys like you who are with your broadcast, with some of your, you know, Johnny Green, the environmental champion, you know, educating people, you know, you really need to pat yourself on the back because, and, and putting me on the program, I just enjoy being on here because I can talk about, I mean, obviously I'm passionate about this stuff because I think it's important and I think it's important uh, to our country that uh, we realize how important energy is. And, and certainly in North Dakota, as you noted, everybody knows how important oil and gas is. So uh, anyway, interesting stuff. All right. Let's uh, look at the clock here. We should probably wind down. Uh, what's next for Joe Dancy? Where can people find you? What uh, conferences do you have on your schedule? And what topics have your interest over the next couple months? Yeah, good question. The um, We actually just got out of our Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission meeting. I was up for a lease and title analyst meeting and spoke um, in Denver and on just unconventional technology and some of the problems you have, technical problems you have developing these shale wells. And we've talked about a few of the issues today. Uh, going forward, actually, I'll be at SMU this fall, which is fun, at the McGuire Energy Institute. And we have a couple, uh, actually the IPAA has a big uh, meeting in, at SMU this weekend, and so I'll be participating in that for a two-day uh, two program. And you know, the funny thing is you go to all these and you learn, as you know, you, you talk to people and you learn probably a lot more, even when you speak <laughs> and present stuff, you learn a lot more when you walk away than when you walk in the door. And you meet some interesting, the people in the energy business are, they're interesting people because they're out taking chances. They're out risking, you know, you work on a well that, you know, you're dealing with flammable, explosive, toxic substances. You know, you, you are taking some risks and generally, um, and you're dealing with a regulatory environment. So that's sort of where I'll be at. I'll be at SMU teaching uh, both the MBA level and undergraduate level and uh, over at the law school also teaching some uh, oil and gas uh, courses. So it, it should be exciting. By the time we talk again, You'll probably have a foot of snow in North Dakota. <laughs> It'll probably be before September 30th. 